I'm Austin Allison. I'm the editor of Campaign Middle East, and it's great to see all of you uh, getting here. Thanks a lot for taking time out from a very busy Q4 for our uh, last uh, campaign online briefing of the year. That is, uh, that is AdTech Playbook, a roadmap to superior performance. We're also live streaming on Facebook, by the way, where you'll be able to watch the video again. Uh, as soon as this is over, and we'll be posting a more edited version on our website in a couple of weeks. Uh, that website is www.campaignme.com, where you can also read a lot about ad tech and all things advertising, as well as media, marketing, communications, and everything else. We also have our magazine. We have podcasts, which you can find in Angami or wherever you get your podcasts, and our social media channels. We have newsletters, we have webinars, we have physical events and more. So I particularly encourage you to follow us on social media and to go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. It's probably the best way to keep up to date on what's coming, see how you can get involved. Thanks a lot to the sponsor of this webinar, who is Huawei Ads. Huawei Ads is one of the largest advertising marketplaces globally with a reach of more than 700 million with a data footprint that combines both branded Huawei demand and external advertisers, marketers have exclusive access to a significant global user base of Huawei device users. Huawei ads are particularly relevant to today's conversation where our panel is going to be talking about ad tech. This is one of the most important and fast changing parts of our business. Our latest magazine, which uh, was out yesterday and should be arriving on desks today, contains both our annual digital essays and a special focus on e-commerce. Uh, and I found reading and editing it that it really emphasizes how central ad tech is to pretty much everything. So do grab a copy of the magazine uh, or read it virtually on our website or watch for all the print content being posted gradually online in the coming weeks. When something like ad tech, is both highly important and highly technical, it can become pretty intimidating. And that's why we have experts. We're very lucky to have four with us today. Those of us who joined us for our Marcoms 360 event a couple of weeks ago might recognize a couple of faces. And for those who weren't at Marcoms, the video for that will be on our website soon. So check out the talks there. Now, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to our panel who know much, much more than me about ad tech and those things. And I'll be spending the next 45 minutes taking notes so I better understand what's happening now and can better understand what's, what's coming next. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our panel and I'd like to welcome Kashmala Khan, who is the Regional Head of Advertising at Huawei Ads, Imad Sarouf, who is the Head of Ad Technology at Shwari Group, Nala, Nala Karuna Nithi, who is the Chief Digital Officer at Majid Al Fatain Retail, and the moderator of today's panel, Gulrez Alam, who is the Chief Investment and Strategy Officer at Arabi Ads. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Austin. Um, actually, let me start by thanking Campaign Middle East as well as Huawei for organizing this discussion. I'm assuming it's the last one for the year. So thank you for uh, making this happen. Um, and I'm extremely happy to have a wonderful panel today. Uh, we have uh, Kashmala, who's representing the platform side. We have Imad, who's representing the publisher ecosystem. And Nalla, who's representing the advertising side as well. So we hope, uh, you know, let's make this an interesting, informative, and conversational session for the audience. Um, before I begin and deep dive into the ad tech playbook, let me um, ask uh, just a fun question to my uh, panelists. Uh, give me an example of uh, one of the craziest trends or an advertising uh, campaign that we see coming out of COVID. And uh, let me begin this with the lady in the panel, uh, Kashmala. Wow. Um, thanks, Gurez, <laughs> with an ice breaking question. Um, and also thank you campaign for this, um, for this uh, webinar. Well, I think I spent the peak of COVID when I visited back home um, in the UK, uh, I spent time with family. So that was when I saw a lot of ads on 
um, again, obviously stay at home, governmental, NHS, wear masks and a lot of, I remember seeing an Uber ad saying, it's good that you're not using Uber and had everyone's images of just staying at home, uh, videos of staying at home, which was pretty cool. And, and um, uh, contactless delivery, there's many I can, I can think of. But in Dubai, obviously the most, the ad campaign that I remember vividly the most is uh, Emirates Airlines. So I remember at first I was terrified both for her and for me, seeing her on top of um, Burj Khalifa. And then I thought, wow, what a time to be alive. Uh, <laughs> so that post feeling of being in peak COVID and then having that kind of ad was, was like an adrenaline rush for me, even though I wasn't on Burj Khalifa. So I would say that was the one that I remember the most. Oh, oh absolutely. And uh, Kashmala, given a chance, would you do that? I am an adrenaline junkie, so I would love to skydive. Initially, I thought it was a, an ad for skydiving, <laughs> but um, I, I, would, I would do that if I was wrapped up and secure. But again, I'm saying that, but when I'm there, I'd probably just cancel last minute. <laughs> All right, Nala, you want to share your uh, story, any, any particular campaign that you vividly remember? For well, thanks, thanks, Guru, for having me, first of all. Um, look, I mean, uh, not a specific campaign, yeah, but as a retailer in the last 18 months, um, now definitely has been a, a roller coaster ride for us, uh, especially when you're operating in multiple countries. I think the most interesting thing, we, we, we did a study recently and we find that in you know, 18 months alone, where traditionally the rule of thumb for advertising always been, you know, you spend about three to 4% of your sales revenue in advertising, especially when it comes to the online channel. But the 18 months, that number skyrocketed to close to 10%, nine to 10%. So almost that means shifting a bulk of nine, $4 billion uh, that traditionally would have gone into an offline channel that's shifting that to online. I think these we have seen across most retailers globally, uh, those, those who have been able to be agile and change and have definitely have done a very good job of that. And I think that that's, that's a, it's not a specific campaign, but uh, overall that shows the mind shift that's happening as well. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure you would have seen various estimates that you know, the, uh, the industry has catapulted the growth uh, that we're witnessing both for online advertising as well as the e-commerce. Uh, fantastic. What about you, Imad? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to second here uh, what Nala just said. I'm going to pick the, the, the retail and e-com industry as an industry where like pre-COVID, uh, uh, everyone was established in some way, shape or form when it comes to a digital presence. But now things like really accelerated into a whole different dimension of what digital presence means, be it engagement with the consumers, be it offering uh, multiple choices of availability of the product itself and the level of complexity of the requirement when it comes to attack in particular from brands, be it on blockchain, uh, uh, measurability, uh, dynamic creative optimization, scrutiny of data and the complexity of, uh, of all things digital and the automation part of it as we witness the digital transformation of the, of the brick and mortar type of, uh, of businesses. This is uh, by far, you know, what keeps me awake at night. Oh, absolutely. And um, I'm sure you would have heard Nala is doing some great work in terms of food traceability using blockchain. So that's an interesting initiative that Carcon and Nala has taken. Um, you know, it'll be interesting if Nala shares more detail about it. But personally, for me, I'm not sure if uh, um, many of you are aware, but the latest IKEA campaign, you know, where they made time as a currency. So next time you walk into an IKEA campaign, you can actually pay by... Uh, you know, the distance that you travel or the time that you travel to IKEA store. So for example, if you're in Dubai and it takes about, let's say 45 minutes to reach an IKEA store, you can actually pay with those 45 minutes when you're trying to purchase something uh, on the IKEA and the amount of, uh, you know, organic uh, campaign lift that they've got, that's tremendous. I think that's one campaign that has been executed very nicely in the recent time. All right, let me uh, move to the ad tech. And um, you know, when we talk about ad tech, I'm sure all of you will agree that in the West, ad tech is very, very fragmented. Uh, you know, if you look at the Luma landscape for ad tech, you can analyze the same that there are so many players in the entire journey from, let's say, the advertiser to the publisher. It's, they're quite fragmented. But I wanted to understand from our panelists, 
about the status of, or, or let's say the evolution of art tech in the Middle East. And let me start with Imad this time. Imad, you've represented the agency side, you've represented the publisher side, and you've spent a huge amount of time in the industry, especially in the Middle East. How have you seen the evolution of the art tech industry? Yeah, truly, it evolved in, in the old sense of the, of the, of the word itself, uh, be it from, uh, it was uh, mainly a simple execution, a simple delivery, to a very complex type of uh, modules bring, brought together, be it on, on the buying, uh, strategy or buying media itself to to the sell side platforms where we are able to not only uh, you know monetize inventory but also measure it and uh, uh, keep it in a, in a, in a, in a uh, 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 privacy uh, 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 you know checked uh, because of all the uh, things related to uh, uh, you know uh, GDPR sorry about the acronyms. Uh, compliance and making sure that we are, you know, uh, accountable for uh, everything related to uh, privacy of the users, and again, the data activation coming in from from the brand itself. So uh, it it is turning more and more complex uh, because too many. Uh, I mean, not too many, but several uh, attack players are being added into the pot. So it it's turning into a luma scape uh, at the moment uh, from uh, from measurement to uh, agency uh, uh, technology, uh, to publisher and measurement. And uh, all these are, are connected and we are all trying to, to uh, make it like a single currency type of exchange where everyone is, is counting on using the same methodology. Uh, there, are, there will be some disparities here and there, but that's why like uh, IAB GCC are working closely together to align on, on all things related to that matter. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I still see that, you know, we are still at uh, early stages of evolution, especially for the Middle East region. But uh, let me take Nala's opinion on this. Nala, you've worked for a long time in the Western, or let's say, more evolved market. And now you're the helms of things for uh, math. Um, would you agree that typically there is a time gap between the technologies in the developed market and, and the technologies that we adapt here in the Middle East? And if yes, uh, what are you doing to bridge that time gap of uh, you know, getting some of the new technologies uh, to the region? The, the answer is, um, is, is yes and no, Gurais. Even in my experience while working, you know, been most, of, most of my career have been outside of the region, but the companies that I've been associated with that we have launched in the Middle East region have been on the par with the rest of the world in terms of the ad tech technology or let alone any technology as well. And I think that trend has stayed the same with many pure players or digital first companies, however you want to call it. Now, the adoption of those uh, technologies, especially in the ad tech, in the traditional brick and mortar business or the traditional businesses that are going through digital transformation, historically has been very slow. And I think the trend is starting to change, but still, it's still very slow indeed compared to the rest of the world. Uh, you do see glimpses of changes that's happening in, in many, many, uh, at least from a retail perspective, I can compare the other retailers in the, in, the, in the market, and not only in UAE, but across GCC and the MENA region, but also in the other industries. We do see there are now introduction of these ad tech tools and solutions that has been around for a, almost a decade or longer now. Um, and, and that adoption is still in a very slow rate as well. That's nice. Uh, if I look at an example, Nala, of the U.S. market specifically, when I speak to some colleagues or uh, clients in the U.S., they would tell me that they typically work with, let's say, seven to eight ad tech vendors, you know, from, let's say, the data vendors to measurable tea to remarketing or however you want to club the data. Yeah. In, in your opinion, in Middle East or specifically for your own brand, what is the typical number of ad tech vendors that you would be using? Look, in, in, at Majid Al Time Retail, we have about uh, four to six tools that we use and very much specialized different tools. Yeah? I mean, we, we, we are not really bounded by a specific tools or number of tools that we want to use. Our, our rule of time is very simple. We look for the best in class in, right. in any of the solutions or problem space and the solution space that we want to tackle. Now, at times that might, might be within the same ecosystems of tools that we already use, which has its added perks to it. 
But many times we tend to see that it's usually not in the same ecosystem. It end up becoming a new tool and et cetera. And if we feel that you know, that's the right way in order for us to get the best out of that problem statement and the problem solution and finding a solution for it, we would go for it. But you know, uh, I don't know about num nine two different tools, ad space and the ad tech space, but for us at much of the time, we've been very comfortable for the last two years or so with uh, around four to six different tools that we use. That's including from the data space, the so data analytics space up to the you know, mobile ad technologies and et cetera. Oh, fantastic, I completely agree with you that as long as the product or the tool is adding value, we should be open to it, perfect. Uh, Kashmala, Huawei, you know, you have a very strong presence in the region um, and then you've been here now for a couple of years. How have you seen the evolution of the ad tech uh, market here? Yeah, I would echo what Nala was saying actually in terms of the slow growth. Um, you know, coming from the UK and the numbers are actually, you could say a publisher, for example, works with 20 SSPs, you know, a supply side platform. 20, I would say, is, is a bit too much or is too fragmented because a lot of the essential work that both the demand side and supply side do, and then it's hard for you to kind of work out what the differentiating factor is. And that's where all, all, all the you know, inventory bit shading and um, a lot of the duplications come, come to place as well, which is um, a con of having too many partners. But at the same time, if you compare it to the MENA region, and again, IBGCC has done great work on this because we had no stats to rely on before, um, before that, which in itself is a problem. Again, you need to have the market sizing and you need to know uh, in which part of the technologies or verticals um, where MENA is most, like we know social video is great and everything, but programmatic is only 20% um, in this region, which in the major markets is more than 80 to 90% in the, in the mature markets. So again, it is a sluggish growth. Um, if you compare it over a five-year time, it's equivalent to a one-year or half a year in the major markets. So you would look at it at a 10-year 10 10 year, um, space. And I would say comparing it, if pandemic wasn't in the picture, would be different to when pandemic came in. I would say with the pandemic, it has accelerated quite significantly when I, when I talk about mobile in specific. I'll say mobile advertising is now one of the most widely used channels in the region. And so there's high levels of mobile phone. And so a lot of companies have been adjusting their sites, their ads, their services to be more mobile friendly. And we've seen that shift accelerated to what would have been predicted if pandemic wasn't there. It would have been slower perhaps. Um, and if you look at the, the demand side, you know, if you look at the spend and the, the dollars where they're going to, you would, it would be surprising to see that more than 80, again, 80% 80 to 90% are going to just a few one or two platforms, ad tech platforms, which is dangerous um, and it could create risk. So again, there's a lot of education that needs to be done, which again, Nala was saying it's happening now, but it needs to be accelerated and hiring of right talent, whether it's programmatic specialists, whether it's product managers, tech specialists, apart from just um, you know, resellers or sales or media sales or a managed media service. Um, you need to look at tech, you need to understand the nuances that come with it, but also the benefits. Um, and that is the change that we're seeing now. But again, it's obviously not as comparable. We're an emerging market and hopefully we'll be seeing that uh, soon. Oh, absolutely. And for all my audience, uh, which is tuned in, I'm sure you've got it from all the three panelists that there is a big room of growth so in case you're planning to launch in the Middle East, this is the right time. All right, um, you know, we, when we talk about ad tech, um, I fundamentally classify ad tech on three pillars, right? Uh, which is around privacy, data, transparency. And when I say transparency, includes measurement as well. Um, let me uh, take privacy uh, this time and talk about uh, increasing, you know, this is a hot topic around the world, increasing privacy regulations. Um, and, and to get a perspective uh, from Imad, Imad, the, the publisher landscape here has evolved massively, right? From technologies around monetizations to ad serving to SSPs, um, and they've improved a lot. Um, on the privacy front, how are the publishers addressing the privacy concerns? Uh, 
Well, first thing first, it's a, first it's a unique opportunity to protect the audience uh, privacy while diversifying revenues effectively. So as, as publishers, first thing, we don't collect any uh, personally identified information, what's called PII. So we rely solely on behavioral data collection and building audiences accordingly. So all the tech we use are GDPR compliant. We make sure we have a consent management platform, giving the users uh, the opportunity to select on and off whatever cookies he wants to turn uh, on and off. So even though we don't operate uh, in, in Europe, but we abide by the rules, given that these rules will, will soon uh, arrive here or they have arrived. Some in the IFC, some in Bahrain. Yesterday, we, we heard uh, UAE as well having some kind of a data protection office being rolled out in Saudi. So for us, the technology that we have opted in to use on all these publishers that we represent is adaptable to these geographies. So if tomorrow uh, we have something to abide by in UAE or Saudi, we can switch a button on and voila, you, there you go. The users will be impacted by that uh, new policy. And we are always proactive when it comes to, to, that, uh, uh, to privacy concerns be it by updating privacy policy on publishers, uh, having a frequently asked questions uh, on the site itself, or a contact us if someone have uh, any issue when it comes to personal data. Now, okay, I'm not gonna dwell on data. I know that that's coming. Uh, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Sure, sure. I have a follow-up question on privacy itself, Iman. Uh, I want to understand that, you know, when let's say I'm accessing a particular publisher and if it's a post login, they obviously track my information and can customize the content. And that's a better experience for me. But given the fact that, you know, with the iOS rollout, it's difficult to track. Uh, with cookie disappearing, it's difficult to track. If there is no unique identifier, do you think publisher has a limitation in terms of customizing that user experience? Yeah, I mean, from, from, uh, from what I just told you, we're being proactive is that we are exploring alternatives. And what, what I mean by alternatives is the IDs, the ID5s of the world that have been uh, being worked out in the, in the background for a few years now. And we have selected recently, uh, almost more than a year now, a, a data management platform that operates without cookies. So it's a cookie-less DMP. It works on the device of the user. So there's no data processing outside the device. The data doesn't travel outside the device of the user. So it's crunched, analyzed, processed on the device itself. And then we serve an ad according to that, to those data signals. So uh, we have adopted and we have been investing heavily in laying down a first party data uh, strategy for all our premium publishers. Since we offer content, we don't offer services per se, the majority of our publishers doesn't have a sign up for. So the content is free to access. We don't ask you anything when you log in or, or visit the site. So you can access any type of content you need. But we value the first party data and we see that is, it is very important for us uh, in terms of uh, uh, ad revenue uh, uh, generation. And we, are, we have laid down that strategy and we're just selecting the, the proper technology that will work uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, simultaneously across all platforms and all app environment. Uh, and the strategy will lay down uh, how are we going to capture the data and what type of data are we going to do that? Uh, be it uh, gender, be it age demography, be it location. So there's a, there's a, there's a right approach to that. I'm, I'm not going to share uh, more details sure. on that. Uh, but we, have, we, we are just fine tuning uh, uh, the strategy itself. And uh, uh, we're going to launch it very soon. Fantastic. Great to hear that. Uh, Nala, from an advertising perspective, uh, you know, increasing privacy regulation also creates one barrier about getting a single view of the customer, right? Um, how are you dealing with those concerns that you're not able to get a single view of the customer? Oh, so, Gurez, it's a good question. I mean, especially for us uh, as, as a retailer uh, as, uh, with millions of transactions on a daily basis, we need to understand how to keep cu customers engaged. But let me allow me to take a step back. You know, at Majidal Full Time Retail, we, we, we are advertisers, we're a strong advertiser. And I think as, as Kashmala mentioned, we are today at averaging about over 90% of uh, fully programmatic 
uh, advertising. So that allows our teams now to explore many other things, right? And um, it gives them the time to really think about, especially be, be ready for the, the, the cookie-less world that's bound to come very soon. And um, that's one lens of it. There is a second lens at Modular for Time Retail as well, which is our own publishing uh, uh, technology, which is the ad tech that we do have, which serves our brands and suppliers on our own platform. Now, we, when we look at these problems, we look at it from both perspectives. One, to, to how to continue to continue engaging our customers and acquiring new customers. At the same time, how can we serve our customers uh, in terms of the brands and the suppliers uh, to be able to continue to target with high affinity brands association and uh, to the customers. So I think it comes down to it. We, we look at our customers' engagements uh, not only in the in the in the in the space of uh, how they how they move around on the applications or web application, mobile application, but we also you see and use the data that comes with the loyalty programs, the loyalty programs of our own, the loyalty programs of uh, maybe the brands it's, itself as well. Um, so we use this information, and at the same time, we tend to use a lot of like what Imad mentioned as well in a real time. Um, uh, algorithms that identify what assets and what advertising that we can best show the customers in terms of the publishing side, but in terms of the acquiring side, we actually have a very high uh, and detailed uh, machine learning programs that runs, that runs propensity modeling that really looks for customers that has most likely a high affinity towards our brands or the brands that we carry towards our platforms. Uh, based on not only their transaction, but the lookalike transactions on our own platform as well, without sharing any information, without the information going out to anybody else and fully anonymized way as well. So there are ways that we can we can tackle, but to be very honest, it's still in a very early stage, but I think that the, the, the our teams and also like you might mention, there's many other teams I know, I am aware that are currently working actively to see how we can uh, really tackle this issue. You know, it goes back to my early days in the career, you know, even in 2007, 2008, you know, the, the talk about uh, cookie-less world and fingerprinting was already there. So um, it, it's just now about time to see we set something tangible that comes out of it as well. Oh, absolutely. And as you rightly mentioned, there are a number of, uh, I would say, organizations working on an alternate solution. I would say it will, will take uh, some time to understand. But uh, just a follow-up question, Allah, have you seen any changes or ability to target the right user post the IDFA rollout? Has that impacted advertisers a little bit? So far, no. So far, we haven't really seen that. But keep in mind, there's also seasonality impact as well. Uh, as soon as the change came around, we also went straight into high sales events, uh, either Black Friday or the now Black Friday is a whole month. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have DSF. We're going to have anniversary sales in, in, in uh, countries like Egypt in Kenya, in, in UAE as well. So there, there is the seasonality effect that continues to play a big role in this. We will see what happens after that. Okay, and has it increased your spending on the Apple ecosystem? I remember earlier during the year, I covered this, you know, one of my discussions that whenever this sort of a change happens, there is a, yeah. uh, I would say, a, a interest of the, uh, uh, the party concerned to increase that particular ecosystem, right? So in your experience in the last six months, post the idea of the rollout, have you seen increase in the spends in the Apple ecosystem? Very interesting. You know, I actually asked the same question to my uh, head of uh, performance marketing a couple of weeks ago. And the answer was no. The main reason behind that is um, we do have a high intent for the customers that we acquire. When there's a high mm -hmm. intent, uh, you know, when you're searching for, especially in our case, it's either grocery or electronics, your, your search terms are very, very specific, uh, especially in the app stores. When we talk about specifically in the, in the Apple ecosystem. Um, so when, when very specific search terms are, you know, usually our organic ranking works very, very well. And of course, having a good brand like Kafu plays a big, big role in that as well. Yeah, so, so that, that continues yeah. to happen. So the simple answer is no, not yet. It hasn't, we haven't really seen a, a jump in that so far. Fantastic. Uh, you know, I was discussing with one of my team members and he picked up uh, the last quarter's earning report of Apple. And if you look at the uh, revenue contribution from the Apple advertising ecosystem, I think between quarter and quarter, it has jumped by, if I'm not uh, wrong, about five to six folds in US specifically. So there is a lot of growth happening there. All right. With that, let me move on to uh, Kashmala. Kashmala, you're representing a platform. 
and obviously that has privacy concerns around it. So just want to ask you a simple question that given the privacy concern, how does Huawei ensures that the contextual targeting works uh, for the advertiser on the platform? Yeah, sure. Um, before I go into that, I think it's important to note that how ad tech came about initially, um, well, when advertising technology wasn't there, contextual um, advertising was pretty manual, contextual targeting. You know, you would just browse a magazine or a newspaper and look for content that was relevant to a specific um, audience and then just place an ad where you think the audience would look for a car magazine or, or et cetera fashion. But with technologies that came into play, contextual kind of took a back seat. Um, and then there was a lot of, because you could do granular targeting through third, be it through third party cookies, through identifiers. And so what came about was this broadcasting way of, of um, targeting for ads. And this broadcasting kind of mentality has been in the works for scale um, and for uh, advertising predominantly has been functioning this way for several years. Now we've come to a point where when privacy comes into question and consumer privacy is the number one you know, priority for consumers, you go back to the contextual, um, contextual way of advertising. Uh, I think for us at Huawei, and just going back to the identifier conversations that you were talking to Nala about, we do have our own identifier, which is called OAID, um, an open advertising identifier. We also follow the certified vendor of transparency and consent framework. And so we're designed to conform with the, of course, GDPR and e-privacy directive. So when processing personal data or accessing storing information on a user's device, such as be it through cookies, through the um, identifier that's opted in, um, device identifiers and other tracking technologies, it's all done within a consumer centric environment when it's opted in, right? When it's opted in, it's personalized ads and it's great because that data doesn't go out of our devices. Now, the contrary to that is what happens when advertisers don't opt in or they, they choose to opt out, which you can do on our Huawei phones. Well, contextual talk, um, advertising it works by matching the content of a web page with the content of the ad. So essentially, this is something we're working on aggressively is you're not just limited to keyword targeting, right? You're looking at the sentiments of a page or a sentiment of an app within an app. So be it, for example, you see an ad um, if you're on a video platform, let's say you're on Huawei video um, and you scroll through and you see a car review Maybe you'll see an ad, uh, not an ad, sorry, but a video for um, a review on, on a car. It could be BMW. Um, what you would get is the, the recognition, image recognition technology, which can have a full view of the imagery and the video content included in the page in real time, can tell you who was in that video, be it male, female, what color the car was, and that there was a car. So when you scroll down, you will see a similar ad to what you, you know, to the content of the, the video app itself. So there's works like that that are happening um, in contextual advertising. And again, it benefits consumers, of course, because for them it's control and transparency and how the, their data is used. Um, but also 82% of consumers want to see relevant ads. They want personalized ads and consumer and to take care of their data. And that for that contextual advertising is perfect. And for advertisers that don't wanna rely predominantly on just the walled gardens, be it the first two um, mature platforms out there, they have more option to do more creative advertising in terms of targeting based on not just keywords, but images and videos and, and it's real time. It's not based on your browser history, right? It's not in the past, it's in the present. Um, and for publishers, of course, for them, it's relevancy. They are working on their sites. They're working on their apps to ensure that it's as relevant in terms of the content, uh, not, in just, not, not in terms of just keywords and text, but they're, they're kind of being very creative with um, imagery, with videos um, to gain um, this whole contextual space. So again, there's a lot of work that's happening um, and it's exciting. And again, it's, it's very beneficial for everyone in the play. Oh, as you rightly mentioned, I think as a user also, and I'm not talking as an ad tech person, as a user, I would prefer to see relevant ads 
I mean, it should not happen that I'm browsing and I see ads on diaper. That's absolutely not appreciated. So I would definitely, <laughs> as a user, prefer to see the relevant communication targeted to me. That's fantastic. All right. And, you know, one of, um, as I mentioned, the second pillar for my ad tech conversation is around data. And I want to go back and take Nala's opinion as an advertiser, because I'm assuming that he relies on a lot of data providers for ad tech companies. Nala, on the one hand, uh, you know, you have the big giants like Google, Facebook, Apple, and on the other hand, you have small independent ad tech player might be providing you a local or a regional solution, not necessarily Google, uh, global. Um, do you think there is enough room for the independent players to compete uh, with big giants? And with that, let me also give you a caveat that, you know, once these cookies are removed, uh, Google defines the first party data as the data it collects from Android, Chrome, searches, and the YouTube. That practically covers 90% of what I'm doing on a daily basis, right? So do you think there is still a room for the independent ad tech players to create differentiation? Yes, yes, there is. And I think this is where a lot of um, uh, more creative and, uh, and, and solutions that are catering for the high intent and personalized manner as well. I think because both you and, and Kashmela mentioned how important the, 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 the personalized uh, advertising targets are there for the customers because you don't want to see diapers when you don't have kids, right? And now this can be provided by the ad tech players that continue to focus on a very specific areas or a very specific platforms, spe very specific uh, use cases with a high intent. You know, let that be retailers, let that be, uh, you know, could be a magazine, uh, could be an online media platform, whatever that may be, yeah. But you do have a customer base that will be uh, coming to you on a recurring basis based on a specific reason. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in our case, for example, as a, as a retailer, we, we know people who come to our platform, either they are there to make their weekly purchases or their, their, their instant purchases, or probably just window browsing for uh, future electronic items. Yeah. But they are there with an eye intent. You know, nobody comes to Kafu just to chill, just to hang out, even in the, in the platform as well. Right. Maybe you do go to the store like MOE <laughs> when, when you feel uh, you, you want to look at stuff. Right. But in the, when it comes to platforms, you do go there when you want to browse things. So there isn't a high intent. So similar to us, there, can, there is the opportunity for many specific players out there who can then leverage advertisers like ourselves or many advertisers like brands, luxury brands or uh, uh, you know, car brands or whatever that may be, who are looking for platforms which has the high intent. So the opportunity really, really is there. You know, yes, Google may cover the 90% the of the ecosystem, uh, but also, you know, those platforms, uh, when you're there in YouTube, you tend to be, you know, you want to watch a series or you want to watch a, a, a show, um, you know, you're not really thinking about buying something. Yeah. So you do Google still loses on the intent base yeah? and, and the personalization base, something that any, any, any other advertiser can give as well or a publisher. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Nala, any specific examples of data at tech companies that you're using or that you like? either on location-based data or any other aspect of the data at tech companies? Today, we don't. We actually have our own. Okay. The main reason behind that is we haven't been able to find, so this was about two years ago, we haven't been able to find a, a omni-channel solution that caters our needs. And remember, Kafu and Majal Full Time Retail, we're not just in the UAE. We are across 16 to 17 markets. And so you know, many players out there will be more than willing to cater for UAE. But as soon as you talk to them, to do the same in, in Egypt or in Pakistan or in, uh, in Kenya, everybody will back away. So, you know, that kind of drove us to ensure that how do we create our own uh, data technology that we can actually leverage ourselves. We have enough data points. We do uh, uh, not on a specific user, but across the platforms, which then allows us to do that. So we heavily invested for the last two to two, three years uh, with the advanced analytics teams uh, uh, that continuously crunch this out as well. Fantastic. Uh, Imad, uh, let me take your opinion from a publisher perspective on the data monetization. Uh, do you think that's happening in the region now, uh, especially on the data monetization, because publisher obviously has a lot of data. Um, are they using it effectively? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to data monetization per se, we as DMS, we only use data to monetize inventory. We don't sell the data itself. So we're, we're kind of a walled garden ourselves. Uh, 
but I mean, if you tap into uh, third party uh, uh, data marketplace, you will see a very long tail of, of uh, you know, small to uh, startup publishers that are monetizing their data to make uh, some kind of, uh, you know, extra uh, revenue. Uh, but I mean, uh, considering us and what Kashmala was saying about contextual, we're heavily investing in, in contextual uh, uh, technologies today, you know, to go beyond the, the keywords and meta tags to actually scrap the content itself and make it relevant to the ad. So this is this today we are running a tool proof of concept and uh, uh, comparing them to regular uh, third party cookie targeting. And so we can see like what works best and uh, uh, so we can uh, proceed with it. But uh, uh, Nanda mentioned something about uh, uh, data activation and uh, some, uh, some player that has you know, eyes on, on the entire region. So uh, I think uh, you know, some key publishers like ourselves are, are positioned well enough to actually cover the entire MENA market as we have publishers from across the region and we cover it and our biggest three markets are, are Saudi, Egypt, and Morocco, followed by GCC countries and Levant. So we can easily have some kind of a data partnership where we can activate uh, uh, their first party data into our ecosystem in a purely hashed environment where uh, no PII leaks uh, happens, and they can activate uh, as, a, as, a, as an ongoing uh, ad campaign uh, fueled by data and fueled by uh, uh, creative work, especially that uh, uh, it will uh, beautifully work uh, in, within a retail environment, given that there's a lot of brands, there's a lot of products, and uh, you need some kind of a, a, a dynamic creative optimizer to actually build those creatives in the back end and deliver uh, based on, on context on, or uh, on data signal. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, what you directly mentioned is that, um, and, and Allah touched upon it as well, that um, typically ad tech uh, independent players follows the money, right? I mean, follows where the advertising money is spent. So it might be a difficult, uh, you know, a possibility to provide a regional solution, but there are a lot of individual uh, country specific solutions that are out there and possibly want to check out that one as well. Yeah, uh, actually, while we are... um, sorry, sorry Gorez, I was just going to add, it's so interesting to see because, you know, one of my predictions for AdTech was the move towards audience platforms. And Nala hit it on the nail on the head when he said he's got his own data management platform. And then with Imad saying that he, they're also coming up with solutions to, to have a more like a unified um, way of having a unified ID or a way of unified um, audience targeting. It's the same case with Huawei. We also have our own data management platform. You know, when we look at our own HMS services, um, we, when it comes to precision, precision targeting, lookalike modeling, private audiences, if advertisers can put in the OAIDs, um, insight analysis, all of that is again, consented within the environment of the Huawei ecosystem, which I feel was, is going to happen more, uh, going to the point um, of Nala, but also for those publishers, and this is related to small companies, small publishers, it's assisting them on what would they do then with their data and how would they tackle, um, you know, utilizing their data, be it with other solutions that are coming about. So on our phones, for example, you can see if someone's downloaded a news app um, and then that user is classified as, as a news enthusiast or a fashion app. So for small advertisers or for small publishers, we're doing the same essentially as giving them the leverage of trying to put in from a platform perspective, putting their insights or their data into our ecosystem, which doesn't go out, but also advertisers putting in their data um, and kind of kind of keeping it in a, in a unified um, Huawei ecosystem, which is protecting their data. And again, it's within the confines of everything that we're talking about. So it's interesting to me to see those two perspectives between Nala and Imad and see that we're going to see fragmentation, but then we're also gonna see consolidation. Well, absolutely. And it's good to hear that Huawei is doing, uh, you know, the services for publishers to provide them a bigger tech play. I think that's fantastic. And um, for all my audience, uh, which is belongs to the publisher category, do check out the Huawei system. I think that's interesting. 
Okay, with that, uh, I wanted to move on the uh, final leg of my active play, which is around the transparency and the measurements. Um, and I'm going to go back to Nala on the advertiser's perspective. Uh, Nala, one of the biggest, uh, I would say, uh, benefits of digital advertising was transparency, right? Uh, we, advertising were able to save the money spent, were able to measure, uh, and that was about 10 years ago. But when you talk about uh, programmatic, there's still a big question. Um, on the transparency and the me measurement ability of the program programmatic. Uh, do you have any recommendation for the ad tech players? How should we address the transparency as well as measurement concerns? Absolutely right, uh, Gurresh. I think measurement part, it, it's still the same. I mean, in, in my point of view and, and I, from our team side, we still see the measurement side, either you go high programmatic uh, uh, way, but still the measurement hasn't really been compromised. I think you can still able to really do have a very good ROI on every penny that you're spending on. But in terms of the effectiveness uh, and the transparency, as you put it, um, now there is definitely uh, now, now more than so in the past has a lot of ambiguity around that as well. Yeah, And uh, also depending on publishers are very fast changing, rapid change, changes that continue to happen, uh, more and more that happens. I think here, what we tend to do is um, in, in from our perspective, we tend to do in, we compare what we do manually versus what happens when programmatic. And we do this on almost on a daily basis. Yeah. And this is to keep the sanity check always, and also to have a second pair of eye to ensure that we are going in the right track at all times. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the only way we can really do that now, um, unless you completely just rely on the programmatic side. Now, what, what happens in our case is that Look, when you reach a stage, you know, a stage of 90%, 95%, where it, it's very much programmatic uh, 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 advertising, it also allows our team to really then use their time to double check this information, to continue to optimize them. Wherever we feel like there is a, a probably lack of transparency or we feel like there is an issue around that. Yeah? So now the teams are spending more of their time on that rather than looking, thinking about how to manually create the, you know, the thousands of campaigns or tens of thousands of campaigns that they used to do. Correct. And, and from uh, the retail advertising solution that you spoke about earlier, I'm assuming you're offering the same similar uh, transparency and measurement solutions we advertise on the Carrefour platform. Is that correct? That's right. That's one of the, the key differentiators. That, that was our actually the main problem that we wanted to solve for our brands. And, and majority of our brands are still using the ad tech Kafus or Majid of Time Retail's ad tech platform through the agencies, through the agencies that they continue to have. Now, instead in the past, the agencies, you know, they used to have that budget spent on billboards or anywhere else, but now they're saying, you know what? Hey, both the brand and the agency, there is a better place for them to spend. And now why is it better? One is actually on the transparency. They, they are able to now see the detail of, uh, you know, if this is a specific beauty brand or a consumer good brand, they're able to know exactly who they're targeting, you know, who are the customers they want to place the ads towards to, and uh, they know what are they advertising on, they know what the ROI, they spend, they know what the ROI, and our platform gives the agencies or the brand team all these details back so that they actually have a full transparency around that. The second part to it is the, actually the more information. Now, it's not an information specifically on a particular user, but it gives not just the affinity details, but it also gives a, 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 the, the full end-to-end -end journey, which is something that you will never get from anywhere else. Yeah. So in, in, in uh, Kafu's ad tech platform, they're able to get saying, you know what, this many customers who saw your platform were able to go through these journeys and end up purchasing. And uh, that's an information was never available before. Yeah, and and the, what we started off as from the digital platforms, we're now scaling that solution to even our offline world. So, which is something which is very unique for the, cust uh, for the brands and the advertisers as well. That's very nice. And that's the key for my audience as well, that uh, transparency is a big thing. We can learn a lot from uh, what Nala and team has implemented. Let me move on to Imad uh, from a publisher perspective. You know, transparency is, uh, measurement is a big thing. Right, um, and when you were uh, talking about monetizing or buying in the open exchange, a lot of advertiser has a question mark on it. Do you think there is a solution for it? Uh, something like curated marketplaces or whatever word you want to call it? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to measurement per se, uh, we've been using a third-party measurement uh, uh, platform for the past six years, offering 
all sorts of uh, uh, measurement capabilities for brands and agencies, be it on viewability, completion rate, invalid traffic, uh, 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 delivery, etc. So, and that's that's like uh, public information for the agencies and the clients where they have a login and they can, you know, monitor and audit all these numbers. Now, when it comes to the curated marketplace or what we call it the PG slash customized audiences, uh, I'm going to steal those two words from you. Uh, so we've been doing that for, for a very long time now. So uh, most of our programmatic activities fall into the bucket of uh, programmatic guarantee. And when it comes to audiences, not only we offer the, the regular audiences where they are females or fashionistas or, or, uh, or anything uh, uh, around those simple audiences, rather we, we can build and customize audiences based on the client's needs and requirements. So we can build a, a specific audience for, for, for Alfutain, for example, or a, a product or a specific brand from Alfutain or for Huawei as a, as a brand, and they can activate their data against that audience exclusively for them. So the, 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 the pool of audiences or users will be uh, uh, for them exclusively to activate against. Uh, be it programmatically or, or to direct IO, but programmatically, this is where the data, the data is activated. So I believe we are on the right track and uh, this part of the business is, is, is growing uh, as we speak. So, uh, uh, yeah. Well, fantastic. For my audience, what Imad said is that open exchange, if you're buying audiences with a layer of data, that makes a lot of sense. And if you are going for programmatic guarantees or the curated marketplaces, with the audiences that's uh, uh, that has a lot of value in it and uh, kashmala from our perspective or from a platform perspective how are you ensuring transparency for the advertisers yeah this is um, a very important question um again i think it, it comes in several ways i would echo already was already mentioned but not to repeat it i think fee structures as well when, when it comes to ad tech players, because there's so many players and when you talk about programmatic, you have the DSPs, SSPs, DMPs, um, additional verification tools, we each come with their own service um, service fee, essentially. And there the there's a fade in knowing exactly where your dollar has gone through all these various layers. With us, this isn't much of a problem because it's, it's a pretty, uh, at the moment, a standalone tech with um, programmatic technology at the core of it, but essentially we are a self-serve platforms. So when it comes to transparency, we have an open platform. You, tomorrow you could just go online, look at Huawei ads and you can register. Even the commercial terms, for example, the contracts are online, they're not offline. Um, everyone can literally read the whole contract if they wanted to tomorrow or today. And meaning that we're fully transparent on whatever our payment terms are. Um, even in terms of our auction dynamics. There's, there's talk on, you know, when um, a bid is being won, it's second priced, advertisers aren't really sure on if there was even a bid, another bidder in the, in the, same, um, uh, in the same level as them, bidding for the same inventory. So in terms of our platform, I say self-serve is the future. I know there's a lot of managed media service too, but that again is the work between the agency and the clients. Agencies would also have their own part to play in this, um, but then the whole transparency work would then come on to them. But as a platform, having a self-serve platform means we're transparent. It allows our clients um, to put control in their hands. They can run the campaigns by themselves. There's transparency in terms of campaign creation, targeting, you viewing their, their assets, um, placements are being placed on you know, a Huawei app gallery, app gallery, for example, which is our app distribution platform or Huawei video or Huawei music. Um, and that's one aspect of it, fee structures. So whether there's a service fee involved with the ad tech um, platform, any additional commission-based fees, flat fee, et cetera. Um, in our case, there is none. Uh, we're very cost-effective for the majority part, there is none. So we're very clear about that. And I would say, there's an initiative that's called ads.txt. It was initially launched for the browser industry, but it's now, it's, I would say now, it's already been implemented for the app industry, but in this region, it's coming to the app industry. It's app ads.txt. Um, we're, we're ensuring that apps are, you know, 
there are authorized vendors essentially that are reselling the publisher inventory or the app developer inventory. And with that apps.txt comes into the picture, sellers.json. Uh, and lastly, we are an OEM, um, we, uh, which stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer, for those that don't know. <laughs> and when making a distinction between OEMs and programmatic media buying, OEMs offer a fraud proof ecosystem. This could, you know, there could be no, there's no manipulation in the ad units, essentially. There's no additional layers between the budget holder and the OEM. And that's why we say it's a fraud proof ecosystem. Reach advertising is fully controlled by the OEM. OEMs understand that advertising spend is only maximized um, if also post impression, um, click install metrics, all of those are taken into consideration. And so it's a great way to use for targeting untapped audiences um, with, a, with a consultative approach that helps you through the entire campaign cycle. So being an OEM or being an on-device for, you know, it's called on-device advertising, it mitigates a lot of the fraudulent activity. Um, so that's what I would add to that. Fantastic. I'm going to quickly, we're running out of time and I have one more uh, section to cover. But I'm going to quickly summarize the discussion so far. So when you talk about Middle East ad tech industry, we're still in the early stages. So for audience who wants to enter the Middle East industry uh, in terms of ad tech, this is the right time. And the key three pillars for ad tech are data privacy and uh, transparency. There's a lot of room to grow. Uh, with that, let me move on to my last section. And my audience knows this is what I call rapid fire. I'm going to uh, throw about 10 questions to each panelist. Uh, this is your chance to get your uh, uh, panelist uh, you know, up close and personal. And panelists give me honest, unapologetic, and non diplomatic answers. And since we're running out of time, I'm going to start with the uh, lady in the panel. So, uh, Kashmala, are you ready for it? I'm essentially looking for one line answers. Oh, God, take it easy on me, Gorez. <laughs> oh, sure. All right, your first question, your take on one line take on programmatic advertising for Middle East. Automation is the future. Focus on mobile advertising would be app driven or web driven? It will be app driven. Your adv advice to advertisers on the OEM specific advertising. Diversify your portfolio and consider OEMs because it is on device and it is foolproof. Fantastic. Your, uh, your take on single universal identifier versus a fragmented approach. Both solutions um, works. Uh, my approach is a balanced approach. Um, unified ID is great for smaller publishers and the latter, the former for premium publishers and advertisers. Fantastic. Your bet on one technology or slash innovations or dip disruption that will have a big influence on Middle East. Especially wow, yeah. Advertising. Wow, wow yeah. by your brand. <laughs> All right. Choose one. Digital for performance advertising or brand building? Um, both are necessary. Um, awareness and then performance driven. It's all part of the same funnel. You're being diplomatic. I said essentially choose one. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess... Uh, I mean, you said one line answer. I gave you a one line okay. answer. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay, e commerce through marketplaces or direct to consumers? Um, marketplaces. Fantastic. Advertising through cookies or device IDs? Device IDs. Perfect. This is going to be tricky for you. Working in London versus working in UAE? Oh, God. <laughs> working in UAE. All the way. For sure. <laughs> and my final question to you, if you were not, if you're doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing? If I wasn't doing what I was doing today, oh my God, I'd probably be in drama or theater, something in the arts, honestly. I, I'm a mathematician. I have a degree in math and math and management, but I'm very creative. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, that was a good rapid fire. And with that, let me move on to Imad quickly because I know Austin is going to kill me. We are running over time. Imad, uh, your first question, what's the one big challenge for publishers in the Middle East? Uh, first party data collection. Fantastic. From a publisher perspective, 
selling on private marketplaces versus open exchanges? Uh, selling on private marketplaces. Future of OTT slash streaming devices in the region? Uh, the flourishing uh, uh, future, I would say. Okay, and your one line advice to publisher for monetizing their data more um, better? Uh, uh, keep on engaging with the with the with the user, so they keep learning, uh, so the data doesn't go obsolete over time. All right, your bet on one technology innovation or disruption that will have a big impact on Middle East. Uh, I would say uh, AR VR. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. All right, choose one of the following: original content creation or content aggregation, which has a better monetization opportunity from a publisher perspective. Oh, original content, of course. Okay, short format video or the long format video? Long form. Okay. In terms of growth, Arabic content versus the English content, specifically for Middle East. Yeah, Arabic, of course. Okay, pick one: connected TV or linear TV advertising. Sorry, connected TV or? Linear TV, the normal TV advertising. Yeah, connected TV, of course. Fantastic. And your bet on the fastest growing sector in terms of the publishing, is it going to be OTT gaming or audio? OTT gaming or audio? Right. Oof, that's a tough one. Uh, I would say uh, audio. Okay, very well. All right. With that, let me move on to Nala. Nala, your first question, what percentage of your campaigns would be using external data providers in the ad mixer? Very minimal. Okay. Uh, first advertising dollars that you would spend would be on Google, Facebook, YouTube, OTT, programmatic, or any other channel. <laughs> Depending where the best performance is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, your advice for other brands, e-commerce through marketplaces or direct to consumer? E-commerce to marketplace. Okay. Your bet on one technology, innovation, disruption that will have a big impact on e-commerce in the Middle East? It would be the data analytics piece to ensure that uh, you know, they, they would need this to ensure what, no matter which publishers or which uh, technology that you're gonna use, but you will end up have to have your own uh, brain behind it as well. Fantastic. And your take on influencer marketing driven e-commerce? It will pick up in the Middle East very soon. All right. Okay, choose one. Uh, as a user, now I'm not asking you as a uh, advertiser, but as a user, would you, uh, prefer more privacy or customized communication? <laughs> privacy. Okay. What's the biggest challenge with mobile advertising? Is it viewability or ad fraud? What's the first one? Uh, viewability or ad fraud? I would say ad fraud, to be honest. Okay. Um, blockchain in food traceability or blockchain in ad tech? Food traceability. That's close to your heart. I know that. All <laughs> right. Um, this is one of the initiatives that you've done. So I'm going to give you a tough situation. AI driven stores versus the conventional stores for Car uh, Carrefour. You've recently launched an AI store in Mall of Emirates, right? For Carrefour. Uh, yeah. It's going to be both formats going to exist. Both formats okay. going to exist. Uh, depending on the market, depending on the locations, you will, you will start to see more and more of the AI stores. It it's more of a viable format now. All right. And my final question to you, Nala, specifically from an e-commerce perspective, what would, what is your preference, cash and delivery or digital payments? Digital payments. Oh, absolutely. It goes without saying. Thank you so much. I think all of you have been a fantastic panel uh, today. It's great to have you, and I'm going to shift back to Austin. Thanks a lot for that. That was, uh, that was fascinating. Your quick fire, your rapid fire rounds always terrify me. Um, I think everybody... Uh, Everybody survived them very well. So well done, guys. Um, and it's interesting, actually, Nala's uh, last point, to, or your last question to Nala about the um, AI stores. There's a, we've got a really nice article in the latest issue of Campaign, written by my colleague, Sophia, about hybrid advertising, that, uh, I'm sorry, hybrid shopping, that looks at a lot of the um, 
Mall of the Emirates stores. It's got the uh, Carrefour store. It's got the the sort of integrated Lego store and things. And there's some really fun stuff going going on there. I've not tried out the um, the AI store, but I know that you can walk around and take stuff without, uh, and they'll charge you for it even without you going to the till. So, um, and that, Your Honour, is what I'm sticking with. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for everybody. And also thank you for um, clearing up acronyms. Believe me, every time you uh, spelled one out, it made it put a little glow in my heart. I, uh, I should know the acronyms. I do know the acronyms. I forget them so quickly that uh, every time you spell them out, it makes a difference. So um, there was some really interesting stuff there. It's very interesting to hear about the, um, you all seem to sort of focus on transparency as being one of the main challenges. And um, also your different takes there on, on audience platforms. That seems to be one of the sort of the other hot topics that I took away. I've got, a, I've got pages and pages of notes. Um, and uh, it's also interesting to hear that uh, a couple of you name checked the IAB, that's the in Internet, Internet Advertising Bureau, I think, and the ABG, the Advertisers Business Group. See, I'll spend that spell out the um, things as well. Um, and the, the moves that they're making in sort of transparency in, uh, in ad tech, so it'll be interesting to see how they manage to accelerate what we're what we're doing in the region and what you guys are doing. We didn't have time for questions there, I'm afraid, and I saw that actually I think you've probably got more questions coming up on this um, panel than we've had on on most panels. So apologies for that. We ran out of time, and I think it was time well spent. Um, so I'd encourage my uh, hopefully on your behalf, I'd encourage uh, all our attendees to reach out to you guys on social media and imagine that you're fairly findable there, you're all tech people. Um, and uh, if there's any sort of points there that they want to, to pick up on particularly. So um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks again, guys. Thanks to Kashmala Khan, who is the regional uh, head of advertising at Huawei Ads. Imad Sarouf, who's the head of technology at Shwari Group. Uh, Nala uh, Kurnan, Kurnan, Kurnanithi, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Nala, I got it okay at the start. Like, um, who's the... Uh, Chief Digital Officer at Majid Alpha Tame Retail and your moderator, Gulrez Alam, the Chief Investment and Strategy Officer at Arabi Ads. Um, if there was a little applause, I'm sure it would be coming in now, but uh, as you can see, it was a real sort of all-star all -star panel, total thought leaders all. Thanks again to uh, Huawei Ads in particular for sponsoring this. Um, really, really appreciate this. We can't do this without our partners. And, um, and thanks a lot to you, the audience, for attending. Um, everybody here can find out more about the topics we discussed today and more, some of it written by our panelists. I think with the exception of Nala, I think you've all had bylines in the, in the magazine um, and Nala, I might come trying to persuade you to write things. Um, so I'd encourage, uh, you can find writing on, on everything we've covered today and more at magazine at, and campaignme.com. Uh, I'd encourage you to also follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletters, keep watching our webinars, listen to our podcasts, coming to our events. It's you guys, the audience, that turn our industry into a community, and that's a big, big thing. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Again, I've been Austin Allison, the editor of Campaign, and uh, thanks again to all of you. And until next year, stay safe and goodbye. Thank you so much, Austin, and thank you, Daniel. Thank you, thank you. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.